good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on the ISTAT Learning Lab. We are very lucky, lucky and grateful to have two of the leading appraiser uh, figures uh, on this panel today. So we are joined by Pooja Kardamal and George Dimitrov. Pooja is the managing director and owner of PK Associates. PK Associates is uh, specialized in aircraft valuation, intangible asset valuation, route and fleet planning, as well as the financial modeling and business valuations. Pooja is an accomplished valuation professional with over a decade of wide ranging experience. She has worked with a number of investors on due diligence projects, evaluating aircraft leasing, airport and airline opportunities. George is the head of valuation at Ascend by Sirium. He has a top level responsibility for current and future value and lease rate opinions, as well as uh, the, lead the annual future value and lease rate forecasting process on all commercial aircraft and engine types. He chaired the commercial aircraft engine by review board, which monitor the CMV and lease rates. So, Thank you both for, for being here with us. Uh, we are having for the audience, this is a slightly different learning lab than we're used to. We will not have a deck or a formal presentation, but uh, we're aiming to have um, uh, interactive and free flowing conversation between uh, our guests today. Um, and the, the idea is that we want to cover as many of the very hot topics that are our going on right now as you can imagine uh with everything that's happening it would be good to have an overview <clears throat> and get the latest opinions uh, that both puja and george have on the different topics so we have seven main topics and i'll let our two guests to to dwell into them as we progress uh first one is recovery from covid uh and beyond what's going to happen beyond the recovery, supply and demand, uh, with all the issues we know around uh, aircraft productions, inflation and escalation, which is obviously a growing concern for everybody, rising interest rates, uh, the focus on how that impacts, um, you know, both lease rates and, and other costs uh, to lessors and airlines. Uh, and fine, uh, sorry, finally, a few more still, the rising fuel price, the wide body aircraft uh, situation, the delays, uh, as well as obviously uh, Russia, uh, its impact on, on on the industry. So a lot to, to cover. Uh, we have 90 minutes. Uh, so uh, with no further ado, uh, George, Puja, take it off. Thanks, Mamun. Maybe, maybe we'll kick off with the first topic and I'll let you go first, Puja. Um, where do you guys see the recovery today? Where do we stand in relation to where we were in 2019 before this pandemic in terms of both traffic levels and fleet levels? Excuse me, Wanting, can I just say that uh, you can uh, ask questions by uh, clicking on the Q&A button, button at the bottom of your screen and write in questions and then Mamoon and I will go over those questions and maybe interject during the discussion. Okay, so please post questions. All right, so um, I think that is a very relevant uh, discussion topic. And so um, just for those of you that don't know, uh, BK specializes in aircraft valuation, but we also do a lot of uh, valuation of airline routes. And so we look at the traffic around the world for uh, you know, Delta, United, Air Canada, uh, American, and see exactly what they're planning to fly and how they're changing their fleets with different things that happen in the market. Um, so it informs some of our view and it's part of what we do day to day. Um, so as of right now, I think, you know, the narrow body fleet is still 10%, uh, you know, not relative to 2019 active and wide body greater than that. Um, I think looking at the most recent month of actual you know, data, the world was, which is April 22, uh, the world was 33% below 2019 in terms of ASKs. 
in total and um, 33% in traffic, RPKs. Um, North America leading the pack at only 10% below 2019, followed by Latin America at 15% and Europe at 20% in terms of ASKs and 25% in terms of RPKs. Asia uh, is, of course, our, our laggard in this situation at 61% below in terms of capacity and 68% in terms of traffic. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I could just interject, uh, perhaps yeah, add a little color, because I mean, that's by region. Um, if, if I could just add a little bit of color on some Go of for the it, George. in between the regions. So on long haul, transatlantic is actually leading the recovery. It's 12% down on 2019, which is pretty remarkable considering in what bad shape it was a year ago. So it really shows you how quickly when you flip that switch of removing restrictions for travel and testing, um, that pent up demand can come back. Unfortunately, Europe to Asia is around 50% of the level it was in 2019 and Trans-Pacific is down still about 65%. So still a long way to go. But I think if we look at Transatlantic as the example, that could highlight something. Um, Uja, did you have anything else on, on the region specifically? Um, no, I mean, again, I think, you know, we know where the places are where there is already recovery, right? North America is definitely leading the pack, both in terms of profitability, revenues, uh, and traffic recovery. Yeah, we, um, we still see intra-Asia traffic, excluding China, down 40%, which is quite significant um, over 2019. And... US domestic and intra-Europe are only down about 7% at the moment, so pretty close. Um, China's been really interesting because it's it's been so volatile. It's, you know, in the past two years, it's ranged from minus 40 to plus 20% relative to 2019. And it's dipped down close to that minus 40 is quite recently again, because of all the lockdowns in uh, Shanghai and other parts of the country. Um, so China's an interesting one because it can dip, you know, they can shut shut the tap off and then put it back on really quickly. And that's why we look at it separately um, to the rest of Asia. Um, I guess that's a good summary of where we stand today. What about going forward, Pooja? What do you guys see in terms of when will we return to 2019 levels? So I think that's a, uh, a tricky question, right? It depends on what happens, right? Um, and what you mean by when we will be at 2019 levels, right? Because if we're talking about traffic, that's one answer. If we're talking about profitability, that's an entirely different answer. Um, I think in terms of traffic, the going theory is, uh, you know, 2023 for most of the world. We think 2024 for Asia. Uh, assuming borders do in fact open shortly here. I mean, I think even Japan, which is technically open, it's not really open because, um, I mean, our understanding is that it, there's still restrictions. You can't just book a flight and go. I mean, there's things like you have to have a package with different people. There's caps on how many people that can come in. So it's not, you know, open in the way that it was in 2019. Um, and then when you think about profitability, right? I mean, so in 2019, globally, we had 26.4 of profitability. I think the, you know, operating dynamics have changed just a little bit. Cost structure is obviously quite different. Um, so yes, we have demand coming back, but we also have this, you know, incredibly higher cost base now. And it's expected to go up. So, you know, I think, again, we think that, and I think a number of different uh, economists around the world think a recession is pending. So if we hit recession, do we hit, you know, 2019 levels in 2023, or do we start to tumble, right? I mean, I think bookings data right now for the summer is looking great, but what about the end of the year? Yeah, that's... Want to comment, that's... George? There's a question from the audience uh, uh, that just came in, and, and that is... Okay, you talked about traffic, but what about yields? How, how is that for calorie? Sure. Uh, George, I, you want to take it or you want me to go? 
I don't have yields data handy, actually. I do have data on flights operated and cancellation rates and capacity and traffic, but not on yields. Do you have yield so, data? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't have data that I can share, but I can talk about it generally yeah. because obviously we look at a lot of different things. So um, look, I think yields are going up, um, but it's, it's not, you know, okay, well, yield is like... 10% up for everybody. That's not how this is going to work out. I think what we are seeing as a strategy by a lot of the larger players is a higher yield on premium. And it, in fact, you know, relatively the same or lower depending on the market and other markets. I mean, I think transatlantic is expensive because there's a lot of fuel that goes into that, right? But I think depending on the short haul segments you look at, it's not actually worse, um, at least not for coach which is not a bad strategy when you think about it. I mean, I think it depends on what you look at, but I think that a lot of them are looking at sort of covering some of this increase in cost through premium passengers, which I think theoretically could cover it better than coach. I mean, anecdotally though, fares have, fares have been going up in economy as well. So it depends on the market. I can it tell you of a fare market. right now in, in the, the Caribbean, two hundred and seventy dollars on JetBlue going to the Caribbean in like summer, end of summer, fall. See, anecdotally, but I think no. it depends. Look, okay, I think, I think if you look in aggregate, I think airlines are so far able to pass on most of their cost increases from fuel to passengers. Um, but having said that, fuel it hit. 125 a barrel just recently and then when you look at the crack spreads on jet a1 considering that we have to share that with shipping now which uses low sulfur diesel um makes it makes it even worse so so far they've they've been doing that and i've and actually this is why i wanted to sort of circle a little bit back to there's the capacity that airlines are scheduling, which we spoke about, but there's also how many of those flights are operated. And if you look at the cancellation rates, the global cancellation rate of scheduled flights sits at around 11 to 12% somewhere there. Uh, in the US, it's around 5%. In Europe, it's 4%. Um, North Atlantic actually has the lowest cancellation rate at 1.6%. Um, in China, it's been 30%. Um, so it's kind of all over the place. We're canceling a lot of flights. Um, no, that's true. So that goes into another schedule. topic, yeah. right? Which is which you and I had discussed yesterday, right? I mean, labor shortages, right? That is a major problem facing our industry right now, right? And I think it's leading to cancellations and so many issues. Which you're right. Um, it's not necessary. I don't. I don't always think about the cancellations, but right now, that's unfortunately a pretty significant problem. Um, it, it, it is, but it's it's helping those yields, in my opinion, because cancelling those flights further trims your capacity and gives you better pricing power, at least for the next couple of months. Um, looking at some of the forward fares in Q4, they already seem to be back to more normal levels. So, so I I do agree with you on the yields question. How long that? Um, you know, the airlines are making hay while the sun shines right now, to use the proverb. Um, and so the question right now is, is the key point, though. And well, and another point that I think is also interesting sort of on the yield topic is cargo yield is not faring the same as passenger yield. Right. So what happened in the pandemic? Right. We lost all of this belly space. So cargo yields went through the roof. Everybody jumped on the cargo bandwagon. And now we're seeing cargo yields come down. They are coming down, I agree with you, but they're also still at a multiple of, you know, two, three, four, five times what they used to be pre-pandemic. So but give it time. And you identified it yourself, right? It's that maritime right now is um, a little bit more. They are a little bit more expensive in terms of car yield. If we stay lower as an industry, then we keep that market share. But otherwise, if we go above, they're going to switch. Right. I mean, that's an interesting sort of space to be in. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, the yields aside, though, um, our view is that we have this uh, projected recovery scenario. So just to go back two questions and answer the original question, our view is that global ASKs will return to 2019 levels by the summer of next year. Um, notwithstanding 
or a session, which is a possibility. Um, so yields, sorry, not yields, traffic should return to that level. Um, the fleet and service is returning, but it's also operating at slightly lower utilization. I think 6% down for narrow bodies, 7% down for wide bodies. So there's a little bit of slack in terms of how hard you can fly the fleet. I think people are not scheduling those very early morning 6 a.m. flights and those late evening flights as much. Um, they're also trying to avoid flights where the, the crew has to lay over on a short haul flight at an outstation because then that keeps the crew um, away from base. You know, with crew shortages, you, you've got to cut off, try and cut out those flights. So, so I think actually that some of the staffing problems may work in favor of the airlines in that they are they are sort of helping them maintain some capacity discipline, um, which is helping to offset some of the higher costs for now. I think the greater concern is, you know, with inflation, and that's something that we can dive into uh, in a bit, but how much longer will consumers have that disposable income? Are we now spending this, um, you know, leftover savings or stimulus money that we didn't spend during the pandemic for this uh, summer and maybe going a little bit further than that? What will consumers do when their grocery, energy bills and other things come up? Will they still have that disposable income for travel? And then another question is about business travel. You know, business travel seems to be coming back. And so will businesses be traveling more in the fall to take over from where leisure travelers um, leave behind? Because the recovery so far has been leisure travel driven. Um, you know, will that those levels of business travel be cut back in the event of a potential recession because corporates are cutting back on travel budgets? So I think those are all wonderful questions. Um, so I think, look, if I, if I think about the issue with inflation, specifically discretionary spending and, you know, those COVID extra dollars or COVID savings, if you will, right? Because so many people saved so much money, didn't travel, stayed at home, didn't eat out. And so I think this summer where they are seeing higher fares, they are in fact, they're taking that travel, they're going somewhere and they are, they're going on vacation. I think as we look to, again, the latter part of this year and next year, I think we're going to see a change there after that long a period of time of spending at these high levels. And, you know, this is across the world. Everyone is facing inflation, right? Because most governments had bailouts, right? There was so much money that was pushed out into the economy that there is inflation everywhere, right? At very high levels, people are spending so much more on their, like you identified, energy, right? On their, on their gas bill, on their food. I think it takes a toll. And I think, you know, people will start to slow down. I think next summer there will start to be rationalizations made on, hey, you know what? We don't need to travel this summer. We, we took a trip last year. This year we can stay home. I think you're going to see other things as well, right? I mean, look, going back to the labor shortage, I think companies have raised labor rates across the board. And as the owner of a small business, we've done, you know, a, a decent amount of research on this as well. I mean, there's a lot of substantial upticks here. And I think it starts to put a pinch on customers. And so to your other question, dealing with fares, right? Can all of it be pushed through? Mm -hmm. I think to a point, but I think at a certain point it starts to impact demand. Um, and I think we're gonna see Absolutely. that. I think Thanks. not for yeah. the summer. I mean, I'm with you, this summer is gonna be gravy. Um, and it could even go through the end of 2022. I don't know. I think we're gonna see a slowdown towards the, the latter part. Um, but we'll see. I mean, again, yeah, you know, yeah. no one knows for sure, but I think I think things are expensive. They're more expensive than they've been for a really long time. So there's there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, while we're on the topic of inflation, perhaps I'll just jump a subject and then we can return to supply and demand later. But how do we see this inflation, which is resulting in high escalation from the OEMs on new deliveries, right? For those of you who don't know, manufacturers have contracts with airlines which have built-in escalation rates. Those have caps. Sometimes those caps are exceeded and then some contracts can go into what's uh, sometimes referred to as a hyperinflation clause where if the inflation rate exceeds a certain amount, and it is, 
um, the OEM and the airline or whoever the customer is maybe less or have to share that extra um, escalation. So in light of that higher escalation, how do we see that filtering through to values? Buja, are you guys seeing that filter through to values or? Um, I'm happy to take that, but you, if you want to take the lead, I feel like I've been hogging the space okay. here, but I'm no. happy to answer. I mean, I can talk a little bit, you know, you have to- I'll give you our view once you're ready. <laughs> we have to disassociate the escalation of individual aircraft purchase agreements from the global value of an aircraft, both the base and the market value. Um, and I think while individual aircraft purchase agreements are indeed seeing very high escalation rates, I think the actual rise in market or base values is not as great. It's, it's happening though. I think some of that is filtering through to the new aircraft segment. We're starting to see signs of it. Um, it's being evidenced in the sale leaseback market in terms of the prices that people are paying for aircraft. And, you know, then the, the interest rate conversation comes into that, but I, I don't want to bring it in just yet. But some of that is filtering through, but not the full amount in our view. Uh, and it's only just starting to, to filter through. And I guess the wider question is, can it be sustained once and once the inflation rate settles down? Who knows when? Uh, can I can I ask you to to, to expand on this, George? Is, is the, it hasn't yet, but does that mean that it will? Is that a question of time, or or you or you're saying that there there's something that will prevent it from fitting it through? It's, uh, if you can elaborate, please. The thing that can prevent it is supply and demand and the competitive nature between the two manufacturers, um, which is dependent on how much they can increase production rates. Um, that is also dependent on the supply chain. The cost of everything in the supply chain is going up. So the manufacturer's cost of production is going up. So ultimately the manufacturers do have to pass on cost increases to the consumer. I think this is the first time in nearly 30 years that the manufacturers have had an opportunity to pass on serious cost increases to the airlines. And I think the individual contract um, versus the next individual contract, it's a bit like a sawtooth. Let's say I order 30 aircraft. The first one starts at a certain point and then it escalates through that until the last of the 30 is delivered. The last of the 30 is delivered at a higher price than the first. If I go back and order another 30 from the manufacturer, my starting price will not be exactly the same as the last of the 30. It'll probably come down a little bit, but it's not gonna be as low as the first of the 30 either. So it, it's like a sore tooth. Every order, the, the price for each delivery goes up. Then the next order, you start at a slightly higher point and then it goes up again. And ultimately that has to filter through. And I think, like I said, this is the OEM's opportunity to claw back on a lot of the inflation or lack of, because the new aircraft pricing has been fairly stable in the last 30 years. Well, we've been in a very low interest rate environment, right? And an inflation environment, right? There's been almost nothing since the last recession, really. Yeah. And I think, so, I mean, I, Sorry, go ahead, Nils, and then I'll... Yeah, there were two questions from the audience. I just wanted to interject with that. So the, the first one on the topic of interest rates uh, is if uh, the uh, sale and leaseback part is over now with higher interest rates. I mean, a lot of the high prices we've seen on sale and leaseback transactions has been driven by low interest rates. So is that party over? I, <laughs> I'd like to say that it should be over in theory, but it seems like it's not. So a lot of lessors are saying, we want it to be over for us. We're increasing the lease rate factor. If you can only sustain this lease rate, then you're gonna get less in the purchase price. Or if you want this purchase price, then you're gonna to have to pay a higher lease rate. But there are still lessors out there. And unfortunately the sale leaseback market is driven by the lowest common denominator. There are still players out there which are doing deals for narrow bodies at least in the sub 0.6 percent lease rate factor range so it hasn't the party's not over yet there is you know there's, there's always those people that are 
very drunk at the party and and stay on behind even when the music is off and uh, and and the lights are being dimmed. I, How I many club I sets have like you been that. to, George? <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually in bed by eleven o'clock at I start. <laughs> So look, I I agree with you. I think there's a number of people still willing to engage in what I think is risky behavior, um, because I agree. I think there's dirt, certain lessors that, depending on their appetite for risk uh, and really just observance of the overall market, they've raised lease rates. Right when they make bids, they are putting them out based on what is out there, what they can get financing for. There's others that are playing a different game entirely. Um, and they are trying to get aircraft and, and they, they do win them depending on the transaction. Um, it's surprising to me. In fact, it's one of those, you know, I've definitely gone back and said, are you sure? Really? Is this really happening? But I think, you know, again, there's always a different perspective and I think there's so many different components to it, right? I mean, depending on what a company's ultimate goal is, they may not even want to make money on a transaction, right? And depending on how it's structured, right? There's so many unusual you know, tools out there, right? I mean, a lease is such a interesting jigsaw puzzle, right? Where there's so many little pieces you can change. Yeah, no, you're right. I, I was going to add that to be a little bit fair to those who are doing, still doing those deals. That is probably a bit cheeky of me to describe them as drunk because um, everyone has different strategic objectives and everybody has right. different costs of capital. So um, very true you know and and your strategic objective may be to grow and to be a dominant force in the leasing sector within this decade and and if that's your objective you'll still be doing deals at those levels even if it's at a sort of break-even level based on your cost of capital can i ask a question on escalation uh, so michael platt hi mike uh, is asking if the we, we talk about escalation right and his point is that aren't most uh, purchase agreements uh, having uh, escalation caps in them. Yes, that's what we were aware of, but we also became aware of more recently that on top of the caps, which are typically around the 3% mark, give or take, there is something known as a hyperinflation clause, um, which says, and I'm just giving an example, of, I'm not looking at any specific contracts, but let's say that the cap is at 3%. And the hyperinflation clause says, if inflation exceeds 4.5%, then anything above 4.5%, the OEM and the airline will share 50-50. So if inflation was 7%, that means that each side will have to share some of that additional um, escalation. And the reason we don't know about these and we always go by the caps is because they've never been triggered in, in, in most of our recent work experience. I mean, the last time something like that may have been triggered, if it existed back then, was the late 80s. Um, so, so yeah, it's something fairly new that's becoming triggered or activated. So, so Keith Down is asking, maybe, uh, Oja, you can take this one. So what is it driving these, this, uh, price escalation? Is it, is it, uh, inflationary pressure Inflation. or, or is it supply chain issues? Uh, I suppose that's a complicated question, right? Because it is both, right? I mean, when you say supply chain, part of it is that, I mean, they're in, they're facing inflationary pressures on that part as well, right? I mean, things are much more expensive as well as the disruption. Um, I mean, they're getting easily the nine, 10% range in terms of components and things for production. So, I mean, again, they are they are seeing this higher pressure, so they do have to push it through. Um, I think, you know, as George identified, I think the idea would be this 10% would be roughly shared. Um, yeah. I, I don't do know, and so, Go ahead, George. I would also distinguish, again, between inflation and escalation. So if, we, if you're talking about escalation in the contract, that is driven by a formula. And that formula, you can find them online um, if you search for them. They are linked to uh, labor indices and materials indices. And they have, between Boeing and Airbus and some of the others, they have slight tweaks in some of the factors that they apply. Um, but broadly speaking, it's a formula that's driving the escalation in an existing contract. If we're talking about inflation in aircraft values in the more general sense, outside of specific contracts, I think that supply chain speed and availability does have an impact because that affects the OEM's ability to increase production rates. And so if they can increase production rates, 
if supply chain was not an issue and they could increase production rates, they probably would be. And then that will limit their, um, their ability to price new contracts, right? Because they're gonna be trying to sell more aircraft and fight more competitively to sell those aircraft. If you have constraints for the supply chain and other forces on how many aircraft you can manufacture every month, especially on the Boeing side, then you're limited in terms of how many you can sell. Then you can be a lot more bold with your pricing because you don't have to do as many sweet deals um, as if you were increasing production rate. One of the reasons aircraft values did not keep up with inflation between, between the last recession and this one was precisely because the OEMs increased supply together as demand was increasing. And so new pricing stayed pretty flat and, and never actually recovered to 2007 levels. So it's, it's funny, George. So, um, and I was telling Nils this before the call, um, we do something uh, that a, a few others have done in the industry in the past, but I don't think any other appraiser does. We do a, a look at the cost approach for our values. I mean, we do market approach, right? Gathering data as well, but we also do a cost approach where we look at what the manufacturers realize in their financial statements from the sale of aircraft, right? So deliveries times price equals commercial aircraft revenues, right? So we do this analysis and we're essentially backing into what a price might be. Um, we're assuming some level of, you know, discount depending on the aircraft type. Um, but I, I agree with you. I mean, pricing, actually look at their financials has been relatively flat. But I think now that's definitely going to change. I think it's just a matter of when. I mean, and I was also telling Nils this earlier, we did this analysis for the Q, Q1 of 2022, right? Because that data is out and um, we didn't really see an uptick. Um, that said, I mean, again, quarterly data isn't perfect. So when you look at it for the year, it's, it's generally better. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's definitely coming. I think it has to be there with what is happening, right? I mean, there's obviously an increase across the board. Uh, just, if I can just uh, take a step back. Uh, uh, there's a question from Madeleine Blazingame about on, on business travel. Do you think long-term that uh, the ESG concerns will have an impact on the growth of business travel? Um, I, would you like me to take this or would you like to yeah. go? Yeah. You go. Me, yes. Um, so I think, look, thinking about business travel. So I have a slightly different perspective from George. Um, I do think business travel will recover. I do think we're, you know, a little down at the moment, but I think, I think overall it will come back. I think as a business owner, I, I think it's important to see my clients. I think it's important. Why do we go to these giant conferences? We go to see our clients. I think, you know, Right now, Zoom and Teams are novel and we're enjoying it. And it creates this level of convenience and the ability to work at different times, different schedules that work for us. But I still think there is value that cannot be there without face-to-face. -face. And I think you just can't lose that. I just think that there's so many other big factors right now that will hamper it coming back. But I mean, I think, again, it will come back in the long haul. Now, going to the original question of ESG, um, I mean, I think the airlines are right now investing heavily, right? And every company in our industry into how to be more ESG compliant and friendly. Um, I think that can only help. Um, yeah, um, I'll, <laughs> I'll say I'm not necessarily negative on the return of business travel. I think I agree that it will come back. It is already coming back for all the reasons you explained, you know, people still need to see their clients face to face. I think Zoom and Teams are just um, replacing what used to be conference calls without a face yes, and just added exactly. faces to it. Um, so in person, the business travel is coming back. It's not at 2019 levels, but it is making a comeback. Um, the question I have, and Nils, I know you just went off camera, but Nils or Pujo, you know, do, do any of you know any corporation that has a policy to minimize business travel because of ESG concerns? Because I don't. I mean, I live in the Americas, which are generally not as environmental conscious as Europe, but 
I think there's a lot of talk and a lot of good intention, but I don't see any action yet to curtail business travel. I don't know if any of my clients having not done a business trip out of ESG concerns, out of travel budget concerns, yes, but not out of ESG concerns. So I I mean, I don't want to be a downer. I I think it would be great if we reduce non-essential travel, like, you know, going to meet someone for lunch for the day and flying back. But Hey, don't it, judge the number of days done? that I do that. <laughs> is it being actually done in the yes. real world? Niels, I don't know if you've... From your I mean, I, look, I think that the uh, combination of, uh, you know, Teams and Zoom and, and the ESG will make some business meetings uh, happen on Zoom rather than flying to the yeah. other end. I think some data... I think for continued maintenance of business relationships, yes. Perhaps we may trim down some of the visits, but for for new business, it's very, very difficult starting new business through Zoom or Teams. Um, If you want new business, you have to get your sales team feet on the ground. Ask any of the lessors that may be into this call, they'll probably tell you that. And I think the same holds true of other businesses. So I think companies' focus will instead be on things like carbon offsets, um, or other ways to manage total emissions rather than reducing the actual flying activity. Although the share of business travel as a percentage of total travel may reduce further. Um, it was around 70, 30 before the pandemic. And I think the leisure component will continue to grow while the business, while the total number of business travelers will grow, the share of total traffic that business travel holds will continue to to decrease a little bit more. I agree with that too. I mean, I think I think there is definitely a shift at the moment, um, right? Obviously, leisure is leading the pack. Um, I think we'll see going forward. I think, you know, it depends on what happens economically. I think political change could change a lot of the different factors we're discussing at the moment, and that could change the entire landscape. Yeah. So... Um. If I could maybe just draw us back into the supply and demand discussion, because obviously values are very driven by supply and demand. So we've touched a little bit on production rates and the ability um, for the OEMs to to produce as many aircraft or a growing number of aircraft. Obviously, that's restricted by the supply chain and other things as well. Um, But what about the other elements of supply and demand, such as retirement rates, um, the stored fleet, the number of aircraft available for sale or lease with lessors. Um, How are those metrics? I think the ultimate question I want us to try and answer is, will we have enough aircraft to cover demand in the next few years, or could there potentially be a shortage of aircraft if the market recovers, you know? if if this uh, foreseen recession perhaps doesn't turn out to be a very bad one. So um, thank you for pushing us along. You were awesome, George. Um, but I think um, I think there were definitely a number of retirements during you know past few years, right? But I mean, if you look at those, right, and you obviously have access to some great data because Sirium does have fantastic data. Um, I think it was really old airplanes, right? I mean, I think some of these airplanes that are greater than 25 years old, I think, you know, are those really coming back? I don't think those ones are. Yeah. Right. Should I perhaps maybe just share some of that data and then I won't comment. I'll just share the stats and then I'll let you continue with your comment. But I just thought it might be useful for the audience. Um, You have a pretty slide ready to go. I don't have a slide. No, I just have some some notes. With, um, so the stored fleet at the moment dipped below 5,000 aircraft for the first time. And that represents around 20% of the fleet. That's narrow and wide body. On the narrow body side, it's less than three, just under 3,000 aircraft stored. That's 16% of the narrow body fleet. On the wide body side, it's 1,400 aircraft, give or take. And that's 26, so about a quarter of the wide body fleet is still stored. Um, In terms of delivery rates, in May, Boeing and Airbus delivered 80 aircraft in total. 
Um, that was 47 by Airbus, 33 by Boeing. 70 of them were narrow bodies, 10 of them were wide bodies. Obviously with 787 not being able to deliver, the ratio is heavily skewed toward narrow bodies. So that delivery rate was similar to April. So that's, that delivery rate is less than what the OEMs are saying their production rate is. So that kind of implies that aircraft are being, either they're not being manufactured at the rate that they're saying, that they want to be at, or that they are being manufactured and rolled over to the side of the factory until they can deliver them. Um, so, so those are some of the storage and delivery statistics on the lessor idle fleet, which we define as aircraft owned by lessors, which are currently off lease and which do not have any kind of future activity scheduled. Um, so they're not scheduled to be retired, parted out. They're not scheduled to be converted to a freighter. They're just idle, waiting for a new lessee. Um, there are 456 narrow bodies, 184 wide bodies. So 640 total lessor idle aircraft. So that's the narrow body lessor idle fleet is around 3.4% of the in-service fleet, which sounds pretty reasonable and manageable, even though 456 sounds like a lot of aircraft when you look at it in context against you know 13,250 narrow bodies in service it's it's actually not horrible uh, on the wide body side it's 6.3 percent less or idle so i'm going to pause there with the less or idle fleet and, and hand it back to you to comment um, so, right, you know, I think the narrow body side, from our perspective, we are still hearing of decent demand for anything younger than 20 years. We think there is still, you know, demand there that will move. And like you identified, right, we are pretty far behind in terms of typical delivery schedules, right? The past years have kind of killed it, all of the production issues as they are. Um, so I think narrow body, uh, and, you know, you and I talked about this yesterday or day before as well, right? I mean, that will be a shortage. I think that's clear. Um, on the wide body side, I don't know that I think there is going to be a shortage. It again depends on what happens in the next year, right? And I hate to keep coming back to this idea of recession, but it will have such a big impact, right? So, and just as an example, when we look to the last recession, right, the 2008, 2009 timeframe, it took nearly four or five years for traffic to recover to pre-recession levels, right? That's a long time. And I know that some people say, well, COVID was a recession in itself. It wasn't really, right? I mean, the minute borders open, people were like, all right, let's go, let's travel. This will be different, right? Now we have different economic pressures, right? If people start losing jobs, if they can't afford things, it is a different spiral, right? Right yeah. now, people want to travel. I mean, I agree with you that if there is a potential a recession, potential. you know, and I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to be chief economist here and try and predict whether there will or won't. I think the market probably needs some sort of correction. But um, if 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 there is one a, a, a little dip back into negative growth for a little bit, I I don't see. Uh, any issue with supply. But I think even if there is no recession and if demand recovery continues um, at the rate it's been going, in theory, and I underline in theory, there shouldn't be a shortage of aircraft, mainly because we've not been retiring as many aircraft as we should, as we were expecting. Um, last year, 2021, we only retired 326 aircraft in total. That's that's a lot less than the delivery rate, and it's a lot less. It's actually even lower than we retired in 2020. Um, so retirements are actually down. But again, that's why I underlined in theory, because in practice, I think there are a lot of that 20% stored fleet is not actually able to return to service without some heavy maintenance. And so in reality, a lot of that 20% stored fleet, and it's very difficult because we don't have visibility of each aircraft's maintenance condition, it's very difficult to predict how much of that 20% will be retired or is just going to sit parked for a long time until its time comes to be parted out. Um, but we cannot count on that 20% stored fleet to be available as something coming back into service. N not quickly enough. Sorry, Nils. So do you, do you, sorry, go ahead, Nils. 
on, on that topic of uh, uh, the storage of aircraft, uh, there is a question that just came in, which is relevant here, and that is that what is the utilization level of the aircraft that do fly compared to the 2019 levels? I touched on it briefly. For those that are in service, you have 13,256 narrow bodies um, as of this week in service. The average utilization is 6% down on pre-pandemic levels. So the daily hours are nearly back. They're just 6% lower. And I, I, that's where I touched on it. It's those early morning, late evening flights being trimmed in some cases. On the wide bodies, it's also not far. It's 7% down. I think one of the reasons why the cancellation rate on something like transatlantic is relatively low is because you've got to carry cargo, which is still at decent yields. Um, so if airlines are having a crewing shortage, they would rather cancel a, sh a short haul flight than, than a long haul flight, even though the crew are not always able to switch. But a lot of airlines now have crew that can operate both short and long haul aircraft. So. So yeah, the aircraft utilization is not that far below um, pre-pandemic levels. There's, there was, there used to be more slack because they were operating like maybe six hours instead of eight hours a day, and 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 that's been eaten up. Maybe it's the summer schedule. We'll see how that ha we'll see how that goes in the winter. Maybe uh, a lot of the more seasonal markets like Europe will see utilization dropping again in the winter but for now it looks almost back to 2019 levels sorry Pooja you were uh, going to say something before um yes but I've, I've I'm not sure where we were that's okay um I'm going to move on to the next yeah Wait. we touched on production and retirement rates and storage um I guess, the, I guess the question that both of us really need to hit on since we're both appraisers is how will that, what will that do for value recovery towards base um, with all this supply and demand in mind, assuming that we shouldn't have a shortage of aircraft or maybe in a very positive recovery scenario with no recession, we might have a shortage of narrow bodies, but not wide bodies. What's that going to do? And also assuming that a lot of this stored capacity is not really available because people can't put it through MRO quickly enough. What is that doing to market values? Um, how have they been recovering so far? And, and how do we expect them to continue recovering towards base value levels? I mean, from our perspective, we're definitely seeing recovery on values, right? Um, I mean, I think, you know, and depending on what you're looking, right? I mean, new tech, even on the wide body front, I think it's pretty hard to get your hands on a, you know, a 787 or an A350, right? I mean, there's a number of airlines I know of right now that complain about not being able to, to find them. And so then they get mad that, well, why do the appraisers still have, you know, market values that are below base? Um, I mean, I think from our perspective, we're definitely kind of coming to that point on new technology. Um, Older tech is obviously midlife wide bodies are not doing well. So, you know, we'll see where that goes. I don't know that we're, we're definitely not at recovery there. Um, and I think even on, on new body narrow, I'm sorry, new tech, narrow bodies, same thing. I mean, I think that's pretty high in demand stuff, right? Yeah. I think it's the older stuff that's, that's lagging, but that also makes sense. What yeah. about you? Where's your perspective? I am, I'm in line with you on narrow bodies. We are uh, pretty close to base within sort of 5% of base values in most cases for NEOs. And uh, the max is still not quite there. I mean, if we look at some of that um, availability, there are only four A320 NEOs and eight A321 NEOs available from lessors right now. There are 27 max aids uh, that lessors have to place. Um, so there's still a, a little bit more max availability. You know, they're still recovering from the grounding more so than the pandemic, but there's a very big difference between a naked CMV and obviously the sale leaseback pricing, which once someone knows that there's a lessee there that's going to pay rent, I mean, lease rates on, on the max have almost caught up with the A320 NEO. Sale leaseback pricing is pretty much up there with the A320 NEO. 
So, so the, the only reason we differentiate a little bit on the max is because the naked aircraft price for what uh, may trade naked, and there's fewer and fewer of those available to trade naked, but that number is, is rising. It's, it's, we've already made it, I think, three increases since the bottom, um, small increases, but uh, it's still not quite at base value level for the max. And on the wide body side, I know airlines are, are actively looking for 350s, 787s if they can. But I mean, there was, it's amazing how quickly the 350 situation has turned around because our 350 values are again within the 90s percent of base value. Um, but on we the are, 7, we're below, level, we're below, we're currently below base as well. But I mean, again, yeah. we're, we're nearing an update, right? I'm sure you guys are too. Yeah. On the 787, though, we're not, we're still far from base. And I think the Norwegian bankruptcy, as well as uh, Latam and Avianca, really hit that market. I think Latam and Avianca were more restructuring, but the Norwegian bankruptcy really affected that market, um, created a lot of supply. There's been actual naked aircraft sales per the ISTAT definition. And the aircraft were not in good condition and they were distressed sales and we adjusted for all of that, but we're still seeing a market value of a 787 being somewhat lower. And even as we speak, there are currently people negotiating to buy some of those ex-Norwegian 787 fleets. Um, so that really dented those values. Will they recover? I, absolutely, I think they will. Uh, Ironically, the longer Boeing is unable to deliver new 787s, the longer used, well, the quicker, I guess, used 787s might recover. And then that could filter down to some, some of the older aircraft types too. Um, shall we speak about some of the older, I mean, you touched on the 330s and 777s. Is there anything else you wanted to say or shall I carry on? I feel like I'm talking a lot. No, you're fine. Um, I mean, we can talk about them. I mean, so look, kind of going back to your point on, you know, rebalancing of the market and demand for wide bodies in general. I mean, I think some of these delivery delays are going to help keep values and demand there for some of these other types, right? I mean, I think it'll help revive some of that, right? I mean, the production rates are obviously abysmal for wide bodies and aircraft in general at the moment. So, you know, look, in the past, I mean, 767s seven, um, stayed awfully, and they, I know they're quite valuable today too, but in the past they stayed flying and essentially were more, you know, the active mid mid-size wide body because of Dreamliner delays, right? And so if we're in a similar situation, that's going to help, right? The only thing is we do need to fully come out of the pandemic, no other problems now. That's Again, going back to the original issue that I keep harping on is if there is a change in the economics, that will make a difference. But if that does not happen and the airlines are truly able to push everything through to the consumer, then that should help their demand. It should help their values. I, I don't want to say come back because I still think that, you know, those values needed to come down from where they were. But I think at least come back to flying, come back to desirability in service. Yeah, I think there's definitely an element of when we talk about recovery for something like the A330, a lot of that recovery may be in the form of aircraft returning to service, but they're going to return to service at a lower price point because especially with higher fuel prices, that's what works for the airlines, right. um, especially if demand is perhaps not going to recover as strongly as expected. Who knows? Um, currently, there are 81 A330s that are with lessors and idle, and that's just the lessor fleet. That's not including any of the airline's own fleets. 50 of those are 200s. I suspect a good number of those will end up being parted out. 31 of them are 300s. Some of them, actually many of them, are probably penciled for freight conversion. So when you take out the part outs and you take out the freight conversion candidates, I think the real availability of A330s, although it looks very large, especially if you just look at only the stored fleet, I think that aircraft type definitely has potential for recovery, not just by market staying flat while base value comes down to meet it, but also even by perhaps a little bit of an increase in, in market values in absolute terms despite aging. 
Having said that, that's still not happening. Uh, some recent A330 sales that we've observed still don't show those signs. Yeah, I, don't, of I don't think just yet, but I, I think it's, yet. it will be, I mean, again, nothing is instant, right? I mean, it takes time to realize the impact of some of these changing factors. Yeah, we're still mopping up the excess spillover from the floor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to use a metaphor. Nils? Yes, so a couple of questions that are a little bit related. I mean, we talked about wide bodies and narrow bodies, but uh, what is the story on uh, regionals, turboprops, and freighters, and maybe also the conversion of uh, some of these aircraft to freighters? What do you think of that? I mean, I can start with regionals and turboprops a little bit. Um, those were actually leading the recovery in values terms. They were hard hit in November of 2020. By the end of 2020, both ATRs and Dash 8s were down about 40% on pre-pandemic levels, which is a lot. And I think as some domestic markets started to open up and then regional markets started to open up, that was the first element of travel to come back. They didn't make huge recoveries. They didn't recover to pre-pandemic levels, but the availability started to decline and values made some, some recovery. A lot of the older ATR 500s got converted and are being converted to bulk freighters. It's a no-brainer. It's a, such a cheap conversion. Um, maybe, you know, three, 400,000 or less um, to do a bulk freighter conversion and it meets that instant demand pretty quickly. So that's absorbed some of the excess supply of those aircraft. The Dash 8 400s are lagging behind, but they are being absorbed. Um, and then the e-jets also, you know, had some real bottom of the market, big deals, uh, Alliance and, you know, others in Australia have bought up good chunks, uh, of those aircraft, which they will own for many years to come. And, and so those made a little bit of a recovery, not, not a huge recovery, but they're stabilized. And I think they're going to remain stable without depreciating for a couple of years, allowing the base value curve to come down to them. I think... One of the challenges to the regional market is US being such a big market for CRJ 900s and E175s is they're not being enough pilots and specifically they're not being enough captains. Um, I'm hearing from some of the big US airlines, even though they have their own training programs, which are producing a lot of first officers, they actually have a shortage of captains because some of the more experienced guys are retiring. And it's actually preventing some of the U.S. regionals from taking delivery of used e-jets, even though they want to, um, simply because they've got nobody to fly them. If you talk to most of the fleet, uh, sorry, most of the um, crewing um, teams at these airlines, they will tell you that they have pretty much zero spec, zero slack. They're operating with just enough pilots to meet demand obviously their pilots are being poached by the mainline carriers you know you hear united and others at their quarterly calls tell you we don't have a shortage of pilots yes but that's because you're poaching them from your regional providers so i think the, the forward growth of that market certainly in the u.s will be limited by how quickly pilots can be trained and build experience to captain level but i think the demand for the aircraft type is there i mean i think regionals have been strong I mean, I think initially they were, you know, everything was impacted, but I think that's definitely led the recovery. Um, uh, I think uh, talking about freighters, um, that has definitely stayed strong throughout the pandemic. I think values have held very strong on that front. Um, but I think I come back to the point I made before, which has been my concern with cargo, which is I think... I think there will be drops in cargo yield. I think the volume is likely to be sustained, but I think the yield is gonna to continue to tumble. I think it already has from last year and it's peak. And I think, what will that do, right? I mean, there's so many lessors that have jumped on the cargo bandwagon and I, I just, you know, and I know that they have, you know, contracts that so they're going to get paid. But again, if the airline is suffering, what will that do for the lessor? in the long run. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fully with you that there is a concern longer term. Um, you have to understand that we're in a sort of freighter bubble right now in terms of the prices that people are paying for freighters. 
and also the prices they're paying to acquire feedstock and then convert them to freighters. It is only expected for that to ease down. We've got market to base value relationships for some freighters at 150%, so even 200% above base value. And no, we don't think that we need to increase the base value because we genuinely think that this is a very heated and unique situation. I think the level of conversion activity has been so high. I mean, the narrow body fleet since 2020 has doubled to 550 aircraft. It's a, it's a small number of aircraft, admittedly. The wide body fleet has increased 30% to about 1,150 aircraft. Um, so, and, oh, and utilization of the freighter fleet is up 20% as well, relative to pre-pandemic. So we're, we're working the aircraft harder as well as converting. But if you look at forward, a lot of the new conversion programs, I mean, the 800 was, conversions were already kind of mature at the start of the pandemic, but the 321 is in ramp up phase. The 330 was in ramp up phase. I think in the next three to five years, a lot of those programs will ramp up and will create a lot of supply. And that will mean that 2025, six and onwards, we will have... Pricing come, values come down? Basically, long story short, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there will be more, but, but I don't think that's going to mean that you have A330s or 321s parked. It just means that some of these very old, there are plenty of freighters in the fleet that are 35, 40 years old, even more than 40 years old right now. Some of that older stuff will just get pushed out. I know with low utilization, fuel price, you're not as sensitive to fuel price, but your fuel price is still an issue to be flying, you know, DC 10s or, or, or 727s sure. in the current environment. So some of that will get squeezed out, but the price point will have to reduce because some of those operators that are flying the old stuff, you know, someone that's flying a 1980 757 freighter, they can't afford a 737-800 at today's prices. But if the prices and lease rates come down and lease rates are a big part of it because now they don't have to buy it cash, now they can lease it, um, they'll have to be a bit of a, a downward correction. Yes, there is an interesting question from uh, Daniel Preedy uh, about the labor shortages that we are experiencing now, both in Europe and in the US. Is, is this truly a lack of uh, labor or is it just that the airlines are very careful not to hire on people if there's a new uh, uh, variant of COVID, uh, you know, messing everything up again? I mean, I think it's, I don't think that's it. I think there is a shortage. Um, you know, I, I was at an airport on Sunday and um, it was a domestic short haul flight and there was a massive shortage of ground uh, handling crew. And so basically there were maybe a row of this particular airlines, you know, airplanes and one guy, there was one guy that all of these airplanes ready to take off saw trying to load all the bags for every single airplane. I think the labor shortage is real. I don't, I mean, I think they are being careful, but I think there is a shortage across every industry, definitely in ours, but it's, it's every single industry right now has a labor shortage. And the thing is, as, as those, uh, you know, baggage handlers or, or check-in passenger handling stuff, as they have to cope with higher workloads as, as their colleagues have resigned, they want to resign even more. So um, I think it, it will either raise airlines costs as they've just got to pay them better uh, to retain people um, or, or, it, or it's going to be a, a bottleneck. I think certainly in the US and in Europe, it seems like the airport staff, whether it's airline employed or airport employed, you know, like security, G4S and others, that is the real bottleneck right now. Um, Pilots are kind of an issue, but not as much. Cabin crew are borderline, um, but it's it's some of the airport staff that, that that are causing a lot of the delays and cancellations ultimately. Sure. And that's because they were usually a lot of those staff are minimum wage or slightly above, and they're able to find other opportunities that might be better paid in in this environment. Next topic. Yeah. Um, so I think we covered supply and demand and values um, at length. 
we spoke about inflation and escalation, but we didn't fully dive into rising interest rates and how those are going to impact, first of all, lease rates and lessors. Maybe we can just start with that one and then we'll talk about other forms of financing like the bank and ABS markets. Do you sure. want to go, would you? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm going to kind of talk about it in general and you, you know, go in wherever you want to go in with it. Um, so look, I, I think the federal funds rate has been kept incredibly low since the last recession. I mean, effectively, what, zero for the past zero? Uh, I'm sorry, past decade. Um, I mean, the problem is that the only way to combat the inflation that was caused by all these government bailouts is, you know, a rate hike. So we've seen that. Um, the Fed funds rate reached a high of 20% in 1980 to combat inflation. Uh, that was also the last time aircraft values actually started to increase with the passage of time rather than decline. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously rates are going up. Um, it's not great for those in the business of debt, but it does help lease rates. Um, I mean, I think, I don't want to go into too many of these topics. I mean, I think, look, it, it helps from certain perspectives, but it also impedes growth, right? I mean, rising rates, the cost, I mean, you know, look, we've seen obviously a huge slowdown in the ABS market, which prior to the invasion of Russia was, you know, pretty ready to go. And I think we've definitely seen changes there. Um, I mean, I know Carlisle came out with their transaction recently and there was a global jet deal as well, but but there's definitely been a slowdown. I think this is more detrimental than good for our industry. Um, well, I, I depends on which side of the industry, right? If you're in the ABS True. market, I agree there's definitely been a slowdown because ABSs are suddenly not looking as attractive uh, as a method of financing, and I and right. I and that then raises some concerns about those lessors whose business model it is to purchase aircraft and flip them into ABSs. Because if you can't put them into ABSs, or if if the ABS fu uh, funding market is, you know, the, the the ticket is a lot higher, then what do you do? You either have to try and buy the aircraft a lot cheaper if you can. Or if you can't, then what else? Where else do you flip those aircraft? What happens to your business model? But for lessors in general, and maybe for the more conventional lessors um, that are not necessarily selling the majority into the ABS market, I think it is a positive because I've always argued for as long as I can remember that if you look at an airline's DOC chart, direct operating cost, the ownership or leasing cost is a fairly small slice of that pie relative to say fuel or labor. So especially with fuel prices raise, rising, I think paying an extra 20, 30, 40,000 dollars in monthly rent is worth, I don't know about 40, but you know, paying an extra sort of 20, 30,000 dollars in rent is worth the savings that you get in return the efficiency, the reliability of the newer technology. Um, and so can the airlines afford the higher lease rate? I think the answer is yes. Are lessors able to pass that on on the new technology? We're gradually seeing some of that pass on. What's really interesting is for those lessors that have speculative order books where you know, they've ordered the aircraft, very often they'll obviously sign the lease agreement um, a few months or even maybe a year or more before the actual delivery date. And when they sign the lease agreement, they agree to a rate and then they put in an escalation clause for the lease rate that is tied to swap rates or interest rates or something like that. And we've seen on a number of those contracts, the original signed lease rate being one number. And because the rates have been hiking up, the final lease rate on delivery of the aircraft has ended up being a lot higher. Admittedly, the next lease that you sign, you may not be able to start as high as that because you just got lucky with the formula, but you will start higher than the starting point on your previous one because less source cost of funding as they need to refinance, right. as they borrow from the capital markets, those are going up too. So they will have to pass some of that on as much as they can. And I think on the new technology, it's getting traction. On the used stuff, I think if you have younger, good condition aircraft, you know, A321 Sharklets, A320s, 738s, less than 10 years old, you, we've definitely seen increases in the lease rates there too. Uh, but on some of the older 
equipment that may not be the best configuration or maybe have a patchy history of operators we're still seeing you know the, the power by the hour lease hasn't gone away we are still seeing power by the hour leases we're still seeing some relatively low lease rates especially on a320s even though they've improved from their bottom um, from their lowest point um, I don't think the interest rates, they're, they're not filtering to older aircraft as much yet because supply and demand dictates that more so um, than, than the interest rate. One, one uh, question though on the uh, uh, interest rates. So uh, do we really need to cry about interest rates? I mean, Right now, one-year LIBOR is about 3.5%, and inflation CPI index is running at about 7%, so twice that. Uh, so <laughs> in a way, while we may have higher interest rate costs, the value retention in nominal dollars is going to be better. Uh, it sounds to me like this is a great time for the source to, to own real assets and, and borrow money. Yeah, I mean, historically residual, but, oh, Pooja, did you want to speak? Sorry, I, I don't know if I... Go ahead, but I, 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 I have a different we'll view. Both, <laughs> we'll both comment, yeah. So historically, residual values have not kept up with inflation. Or maybe our curves, as, as appraisers, as a collective, our curves were perhaps too high. Because I know a lot of appraisers will tell you, oh, aircraft only experience 1% inflation on used values. Well, inflation applies to the US dollar. And if you're trading aircraft predominantly in US dollars, then the general inflation rate applies to aircraft too. It just means that maybe the forecast was too high. But the point is, because new pricing on aircraft has stayed flat, it, it has followed that use pricing hasn't really gone up much. But one thing is changing. One thing that we've really observed change in the last decade is the floor. The floor, which is the part out value at how much you can sell an aircraft, has definitely increased a lot. We were selling MD-80s for maybe one, two million or less. We were selling classics for maybe, you know, one and a half to three million. We're selling A320s now for part out for, depending on condition, five to 10 million. Um, so the part out values have increased because the engine values have increased because the engine maintenance cost, the engine complexity has increased. And I think for the new generation, the Max and the Neo, those engine maintenance costs and engine values are going to be even higher. So I think the floor at the aircraft's end of life is rising. Even if the residuals on a maybe five, 10 year old may not be benefiting that much from inflation, I think the floor is rising because of maintenance costs, LLP prices and other things. And so as that floor rises, if the new aircraft price is not rising as much, it means that you have less of a depreciation gap. That means you're incentivized to part out aircraft younger. So our base values project that um, a 10 year old max may be a part of opportunity, not because it's a bad aircraft, but because the engines are gonna be worth so much that it may be more attractive to actually remove those engines and sell them than to try and market the aircraft as a, as a whole flyable unit. So, so that's a dynamic that's really changed, I think in the last 10 years. And that's because we've now started to part out a lot more of the CO and NG generation. Whereas with the previous generation, they were very simple technology with relatively low residual end of life values. So, um, so, so there's another question here that is kind of interesting. Uh, so airline costs are increasing on all fronts. And at the same time, they have uh, taken on uh, two to three years of re uh, revenue in form of new debt. Uh, how are they going to work themselves out of this? Isn't this going to take like 20 to 30 years to come out of that uh, debt mountain that they are, have put themselves into? But I think our industry is one that is meant to be leveraged, right? I mean, we have high CapEx. So I think, you know, look, before the pandemic, we saw so many airlines delever. Um, and so they were ready to lever when needed. Um, I think our industry always requires a certain amount of debt, right? I mean, I think the idea of zero debt is, to me, it, it's, it's inconsistent with the business model for an airline. And so... Do they need to get out of all the debt or can they maintain a certain level of debt throughout this? Um, 
as long as they can repay the debt, why is that a bad thing? And also, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the speed at which airlines can pay back debt. Sometimes I'm surprised. I mean, there were airlines paying back big chunks of debt even last year, barely a year out of the worst of the worst. They were paying back big chunks of debt. And of course, they were paying back that debt, which was the most expensive in terms of interest rate, because obviously they don't want to hold that. So once they had a little bit of cash flow, they, they focused on paying that. But Airlines, once things get good for airlines, and again, reverting to that elephant in the room about will there be a recession, but assuming that the, any slowdown is not too bad, once things get good, airlines can pay down debt surprisingly quickly. They also, prior to this pandemic, they had been paying for so many aircraft with cash. They had a lot of unencumbered aircraft, and a lot of, that, a lot of those funds were raised through, through sale and leasebacks. Which is, you know, depends. I'm not an accountant, but is it is sale and lease back debt or have you just switched to leasing the aircraft instead of buying it? I mean, you're not going to buy back that aircraft that you've done a sale. And likelihood is you'll keep leasing that aircraft to lease expiry and right. maybe even beyond. So, so um, a lot of that funding was raised through means like sale and lease backs, which I think will stay. And I think if anything, the airline's financial, the, the airline's balance sheets were in such a strong position at the end of 2019 um, with so many unencumbered aircraft that, that they were able to raise the funds using some of the reserves that they had in their fleet, essentially. And these are low interest rates. So I think, I mean, it's not really a mountain, right? I mean, it, so having personally looked at the cost of capital for all of the legacy carriers within... North America. I mean, it's low. Their cost of debt on average is very low. Now it will theoretically change as we move forward, but they're not in a bad position right now. And for this summer, for sure, things will look very positive. Yeah. It's a matter of what happens next year, right? And who knows? I just want to touch on one quick topic. We've spoken a lot about fuel price, and I think we've already discussed a lot about how fuel prices are going to affect things and affect the decision between younger and older aircraft, but um, fuel burn is obviously tied with emissions, right? And so the question I want us to consider is, will ESG pressures from governments or from just corporate and social responsibility perspective for publicly traded companies, will ESG pressures go beyond just the pressure that the fuel, fuel price is already putting a pressure on airlines to modernize their fleet and effectively reduce emissions because they want to burn less fuel and spend less money on fuel. Do we think that there's going to be additional ESG pressure over and above that fuel price pressure? Or will the fuel price pressure effectively do the job of, of the environmental goals? I mean, I think... I think that right now, I think that's enough. Um, I don't know that I think the other, you know, the S and G necessarily play a role specifically or directly on aircraft values. Um, I mean, I think they impact the operations of the company and how the companies are perceived, right? I think, you know, a more ESG friendly company is going to be well received. And I think there are incentives to them right now in the marketplace, right? For, for theoretically better financing, even mm -hmm. just a little bit better. Um, I think again, though, I think it'll depend on, you know, the goals of those offering the debt, right? Will those opportunities still exist going forward as cost of debt rises? Are we still going to make these, you know, concessions or will that change and fall away? I mean, it depends so much on what happens with fuel price, right? Right now we're incredibly high. Well, if, if we have a regulatory change, a regime change in 2024, I mean, what if we start drilling in the U.S. again, right? It is a possibility. I think so, because I think the U.S. government is under a lot of political pressure to reduce fuel prices for the ordinary consumer for their cars, given how car reliant the U.S. is. Uh, and so despite all the good talk and intentions of this administration, I'm not entirely convinced on whether they will put additional pressure on companies or consumers beyond what the fuel price is already doing. But for 
for Europe, I think it's a little different. I think in Europe True. there are additional ESG considerations over and above um, the fuel price. And I think some of the loans that were given to airlines during the pandemic, both by governments and by banks, uh, by private banks, were conditional on, certainly the government, a lot of the government loans were conditional on carbon reduction. In addition to that, we, we believe as, at Sirium that there will be some sort of carbon prices, whether it's a fuel tax or carbon, um, uh, some sort of carbon trading scheme. Right. We believe that's coming. The US is back in the Paris Agreement. Um, there may be some short-term distraction right now by inflation and high fuel prices, but in, in the longer term, those are coming back in. And actually, our base values are now not just driven by fuel price, but by what we call the cost of burning fuel. So we're factoring in the fuel price forecast in absolute terms and a carbon price on top of that uh, into our model for, for aircraft residual values. Um, so, so I think it depends on the region that you're in. I think that's right. And I think you're right about the carbon credits as well. I mean, I think, I think that's been coming. I mean, I think, you know, there's been discussion about trading of carbon credits for a long time. I mean, like more than a decade ago. Um, and so I think you're right. I think depending on the region, that's going to become more of a, a mainstream issue. Um, yeah. Some small European countries have pushed it back a little bit temporarily, but it's, it's still kicking in pretty soon. And with that, I'm just conscious of time. We're nearly, we're just nine minutes away from the ending. And so I wanted to touch on Russia. Um, and, you know, Niels, feel free to butt in if there are any other questions. But obviously, we can't not talk about what's happened uh, with Russia and Ukraine and the subsequent sanctions on that. Um, again, Pooja, if you don't mind, I'll set yeah. the scene with a bit of stats from our fleet That's tracking. The Russian schedule has declined, but domestic Russian traffic today is still in the high 20s, I think 26 or 27 percent above 2019 levels. So, yes, international Russian traffic in and out of Russia is down 70 percent. Um, but it seems like the airlines and the market, the domestic market seems quite resilient. And yes, although it has come down, it's still 27% or 26% above 2019 levels. The commercial jet fleet within Russia has declined by about 100 aircraft through lease terminations, but it has stabilized. Uh, the, last, the last couple of weeks do not show any more aircraft entering storage. To give you an idea, there are 677 aircraft in service in Russia uh, and 194 are stored. So about 22% storage rate within the Russian fleet. I guess maybe some of that stored fleet, not I guess, we've seen photographic evidence that some of that parked fleet is already being cannibalized to support the remaining in-service fleet. I guess the question remains, how long can that be sustained? So Pooja, you know, I can also chip in, but um, what is the impact of all of this on aircraft supply into other markets outside of Russia? What's happened or happening to those 100 aircraft or so that have managed to come out of Russia. And, um, and you know, I guess the final question, which is the really tricky one, is what is the value of those aircraft that are remaining in Russia and effectively stolen from insurance standpoint? Um, sure. So I think from a... I mean, I think one of the other sort of concerns, maybe not specifically or directly raised, was um, some of the implications related to flying over Russian airspace, right? So there's That's so true. many yeah. airlines that are impacted. Their their entire business models are impacted going to Asia, right? I mean, um, where, you know, now you have to massively increase the airtime. And so for certain airlines that we look at where there was an impact, we we changed how we modeled it. Um, to sort of increase flying time. I mean, it, it is a problem. Um, and I think certain airlines are assuming that at some point they will be given access to fly over Russian airspace again. I mean, we'll see. Um, I think that's a big question. I think in terms of 
values. I think that's a very interesting point. And I'll share what our view is right now. And I would love to hear yours too. I think it's a very, very interesting topic, um, right? Because most of what we do, and we don't, um, you know, we don't do aircraft inspections. Most of what we do is desktop. So we're assuming, right? We're making assumptions about and aircraft's condition and airworthiness and all this stuff, maintenance records, except, um, right, we know that that's not necessarily the case. So now we're not just making an assumption, we're making a incorrect assumption, right? A hypothetical situation, which we know is not true. So what we've been researching, and we don't have an exact decision on where we go with this, but what we are researching is, is collections. I think that's where we think the value comes out, but it's essentially like a collections claim, right? Mm -hmm. Because the value is not zero and it's not a hundred percent of what it was either, right? It's it's that if you were gonna sell this to someone else, what would they pay? And essentially the, the kind of buyer that would be interested in buying would be essentially buying like on a collections claim, right? It's a bad debt. Yeah. They, could, they could collect on it, who knows in what condition, at what point in time, but they also might get nothing. And I think it's a very comparable way to think about it. So that is kind of the line of thinking that we're going through. Um, and that's the way we're thinking about what that value might be. Would love to hear your thoughts too. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. We are also still forming our views on what aircraft stuck in Russia may be worth. We've had to add a hypothetical a disclaimer almost in our reports that says yes. this value is hypothetical. Right. Now, I know some appraisers have said that the value is zero. And I don't agree with that because it right. doesn't just flip to zero overnight, 30 days after the sanctions kicked in. Um, some aircraft were pulled out of Russia beyond that point, despite you know some of the changes. I mean, if you have an A320neo, for example, and this is where we've we've been focused. Uh, on things like the maintenance condition of the aircraft. And this is where we don't have enough visibility, but we're potentially right. Once sanctions are lifted, who knows when. If you have aircraft that have never had heavy maintenance due, that maybe were brand new at the start of this, um, once you do a thorough inspection, once you have all the records, I mean, the Russian airlines were pretty good at record keeping and at uh, at maintenance, you know, most of their maintenance was done at foreign organizations outside of Russia, which is a problem. Um, they did some of it in-house, usually line maintenance. Um, but there may be some aircraft that have been lucky and maybe reasonably well maintained and have not actually violated any of the maintenance clauses. Now, there's a whole legal discussion about you know, deregistering from Bermuda and, and re-registering on the Russian register and the credibility of aircraft that have been maintained under the Russian authorities, you know, how easy will it be to bring back the, those aircraft under an EAS or FAA jurisdiction? Um, that's a whole other question. But from a pure maintenance perspective, we know that values are definitely going to be decreasing um, over time. And I think the big step changes in value will be when those aircraft hit heavy maintenance. If those aircraft have to be maintained with unauthorized PMA parts um, manufactured locally in Russia, um, then the greater the content of material in, the, in those aircraft, which is unauthorized, then the quicker their value tumbles. Um, if records have switched to Russian or start to get patchy or missing, again, the value can very quickly move towards part out. But if you don't reach those heavy maintenance events and you do maintain light line maintenance in accordance with EAS or FAA standards, then those aircraft could still have value. So, so the answer is it's not full CMV, but it's not zero either. Right. And that's, that's really what we're trying to establish. And, and I agree with you that looking at claims is, is another great perspective to think about it. I think another thing to think about is is the cost of records recreation to the extent that the records are not kept up, right? That would be a theoretical deduction, if you will. I mean, again, there's so many variables here, right? Like the the unauthorized PMA parts, I hadn't thought about that one, but that's definitely a component as well. But that's it. Who knows, right? We won't know until we see something. So it's exactly. very hard when it's we get these hole. questions on. It's a black hole. Um it's a very complex thing, uh, but I agree. It's not zero. It's definitely not zero. I think that's the wrong answer. And I don't think the insurance companies are paying, right? They're not giving 100% back. So 
if the lessor is not made whole, you really can't argue it's zero. Well, I think the litigation between insurance companies and lessors is only just beginning and who knows when it will this end. This is true. This um, is true. But I mean, you could argue that the aircraft has some value somewhere. It could be part out, it could be above. And that, For you know, sure. the, maybe the litigation decides that the insurance company still needs to pay the claim. And then if sanctions end, then the asset taken out of Russia belongs to the insurance company. And maybe they can monetize part of that value or maybe not. I think there's just way too many unknowns to form a, yes. a firm opinion on it at this stage. Right. Great. That's great. L look, um, there were a, a number of questions that we couldn't uh, go through. This was a bit of an experimental uh, format of the learning lab. And unfortunately, some of the questions came in out of sequence with the, uh, with the agenda, so to speak. So I, I didn't want to kind of make everything too confusing by bringing up stuff we talked about 10 minutes ago. But uh, I, it was very interesting. And uh, Mamoun and I would like to thank uh, Pooja and George for good insights. I don't know if we have all the answers, but again, uh, that's part of the uh, charm of our industry. So uh, we're going to be back with more learning labs. Uh, watch out at uh, the istat.org website for, uh, for future labs. And then uh, thank you so much for dialing in and thank you so much to our panel. And thank you, Mamoun. Yeah, well, thank you, George. Thank you for the great conversation. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.